Welcome, everyone. I think people are still entering the Zoom room. It is a privilege to welcome you tonight to another iteration of A Plus D Mondays, our weekly program that features the people and ideas that most compel the Berkeley faculty, students, and community. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts Plus Design. It's a privilege to welcome you here again. Um, if you have tuned with into this series all last semester or this year so far, um, you often have heard me say that this series is usually hosted in the beautiful theater of BAM PFA. We look forward to returning eventually. And for now, we're happy to connect with all of you online. Uh, if you also, many of you also know that this series uh, is sits next to a course. There's a, a, a number of students who are enrolled in Humanities 20 on exploring the arts and design at Berkeley. Welcome students to that, along with community and faculty from different parts of our campus and the country and the world. Uh, you also know, um, many of you, that this series is co-curated with a range of incredible campus units. Uh, campus departments such as art practice, schools and institutes such as um, College of Environmental Design, the Graduate School of Journalism, Cal Performances, the Arts Advocates of Berkeley Law, Future Histories Lab, um, as well as um, BAM PFA itself. Uh, tonight, I'm very privileged that we're going to be uh, working, that we're working in collaboration with the Berkeley Center for New Media. I'll also tell you uh, and make sure that everyone knows that the theme for the entire series has been um, developed collectively around the theme of togetherness. We're calling this series Together, Reinventing Politics, Reimagining Health, a kind of framing that uh, bespeaks our shared commitment to thinking about the aesthetics and politics of being together, online and offline, especially at a time when our political lives and our embodied lives seem to be in constant and often necessary redefinition. Berkeley Center for New Media is a nexus within our campus for exploring exactly these kinds of questions. Berkeley Center for New Media is itself an interdisciplinary research center that uh, both um, studies and develops media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through thinking and making, we cultivate technological equity and fairness in our classrooms, in our communities and on the internet. As part of that effort, Berkeley Center for New Media has developed an incredible platform on indigenous technologies that very centrally and urgently advance those goals. And it's from that platform tonight that we get to share um, tonight's theme, tonight's event. Uh, I only have, the, I have the privilege now of turning it over to the incredible leader, the, technolo the coordinator of indigenous technologies, um, Marcelo Garzo Montalvo. Marcelo is a musician, ceremonial dancer, ethnic studies activist and scholar who is simultaneously serving as visiting assistant professor in Latinx studies at Harvard while serving as the technological coordinator of indigenous technologies. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome Marcelo and hope all of you will too, even as you're muted, uh, please. Um, offer a warm welcome in the chat to Marcelo. I'll turn the screen over to you. Thank you so much, um, Shannon. That's uh, very generous um, of you to open up the space for us. Um, I want to start by saying my Mari, Compuche, Upeñi, Ulamien. Buenas tardes, buenas noches, buenos días, depending on where we're signing in from. Um, uh, I could also say good afternoon, good evening. I could also say Kualiteotlaxin. I'm just really um, grateful to uh, be here. I want to begin also by giving thanks for my life, um, giving thanks to the Creator for giving us another day of life and you know uh, the opportunity to be here in this uh, really important and urgent and, and uh, such a uh, you know beautiful space and community to have this important conversation. Um, so uh, I am tasked with, uh, you know, introducing and, and 
sharing the work of indigenous technologies um, as a program. I'm very honored to be um, part of the team that coordinates this. So I, I would uh, resist being called the leader of this. I'm very much part of a collective effort um, to uh, amplify indigenous voices in this question of the technological. Um, so for our program, um, we are from the Berkeley Center for New Media and uh, we engage questions of technology and new media in relation to global structures of indigeneity, settler colonialism and genocide. And I would add uh, decolonization and resistance and survivance despite um, settler colonialism and genocide in these territories in the 21st century. Um, our indigenous technology events and ongoing conversations with indigenous scholars and communities aim to critically envision and reimagine what a more just and sustainable technological future can look like. Uh, we highlight indigenous engagements with robotics, computer science, telecommunications, fire, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, social media, online activism, video games, and more. Uh, so as you see, we have a really uh, capacious, right? A really um, generous understanding of what is the technological. Uh, one part of it is the ways in which um, folks are decolonizing the technological, indigenizing the technological, but also honoring our ancestral technologies, indigenous technologies um, that uh, give us another way to engage in these conversations. Um, that's definitely been at the heart of this, uh, of this work, as well as uh, what we've been talking about as um, being good relatives, right? How does this work allow us to be good relatives? And so in that way, I also want to begin by um, acknowledging that I am here um, in Huchin, in um, unceded and ancestral lands of Checheno, Ohlone, Mawekma, Lishan, Ohlone people. Um, and we also would like to say that the history of this prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land and this place. And all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. Uh, we commit as uh, Indigenous Technologies and Berkeley Center for the New Media at large to supporting the sovereignty and the ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples. They're building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. Um, and so um, along those lines, uh, I'm really um, grateful uh, for this conversation today around fire ecologies, um, around being a good relative with the fire, right, itself. Um, and uh, one little story I will share that I think is relevant is that we launched this program in September uh, with a conversation with um, Karina Gould uh, of the Confederated Villages of Lishan, um, uh, whose ancestral territories the UC Berkeley sits on. Uh, and in that conversation, we had that conversation on those days, if we remember here in Ohlone territory, under that orange sky, right? And that was made orange by and covered, you know, the sun by smoke from these, these really out of control uh, and really aggressive um, wildfires that were burning all around us. Um, and I bring that up because um, that really is, continues to be the context of this conversation. And I just wanted uh, to remind us of, of that day or those days or any of those kinds of memories, not as a way to kind of reopen maybe some anxiety we have around that, but more so just to remember the stakes and the urgency of this kind of conversation. Um, and in, in, in particular, I think, as those of us who are affiliated with universities of California, the importance of amplifying uh, our native California relatives voices and work that they're doing um, to, to be in right relation and partnering with us. So um, in that way, I'm very honored to um, introduce our moderator for today, for tonight is Alexi Signona. Uh, that is um, our, our, our moderator is uh, Amamutsen tribal leader. Uh, Armamutsin tribal member, excuse me, uh, I'm sure he's a leader as well, um, but he's a graduate student in environmental science policy and management, um, and he is an Armamutsin youth group leader, okay, there's, there's his leadership, uh, at least in one level. Um, his work really focuses on indigenous collaborative stewardship, and um, we're really, really honored and, and really uh, 
uh, grateful that he accepted our invitation to moderate this conversation tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Alexi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcella, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to the Berkeley Center for New Media and Berkeley, Berkeley Arts Plus Design for supporting this Indigenous Technologies event. Mishmin Shruhis, Panraka Alexi, Kantara Hutkin. Good evening, my name is Alexi, and I am currently residing on Uchin Ohlone land. Uh, it is an honor to serve as a moderator for our two very distinguished speakers. Um, and although our event tonight is titled a conversation on wildfire ecologies. I'm sure that our, our panelists will elaborate more on different relationships to fire and how fire may not be as wild as we think. Um, and so without further ado, um, I will get to introducing our two speakers. So Margot Robbins is the co-founder and president of the Cultural Fire Management Council, CFMC. She is one of the key planners and organizers of the Cultural Burn training exchange, TREX, that takes place on the Yurok Reservation twice a year. She is also a co-lead and advisor for the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. Margot comes from the traditional Yurok village of Moret and is an enrolled member of the Yurok tribe. She gathers and prepares traditional food and medicine, is a basket weaver and regalia maker. She is an Indian education director for the Klamath Trinity Joint Unified School District, a mom and a grandma. And for Valentin Lopez, um, he, is chair, he has served as a chair of the Amamutsun Tribal Band since 2003 and the president of the Amamutsun Land Trust since its inception. Valentin is a Native American advisor to the University of California Office of the President on issues related to repatriation. He's also an advisor for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, and is a traditional Mutsun dancer. He is actively involved in efforts to restore tribal indigenous knowledge and ensure our history is accurately told. And because of Chairman Lopez, Chairman Lopez's work to restore Amamutsun culture, I personally have been able to connect with my identity as part of the Native Stewardship Program and member of our youth group, which inspires my work here at UC Berkeley. And I'm certain that both of our guests tonight have inspired and created opportunities for tribal youth and future generations. And just as a quick logistical reminder, uh, we will save questions until after both panelists are able to present. Uh, and please make sure to use the Q&A Zoom future feature for questions for our panelists. Margo, thank you for again for being here. Uh, we'll start with you. Ayukui, Nicknow Margo Robbins, Te Wamehkotki Nanes Kwachok. I'm happy to be here. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. So you can see some pictures of fire because talking doesn't half do the job unless you can see pictures of flames. Huh, it is not starting. Can you guys see my, oh. No, sorry, I'm having a bit of technical difficulties here. Let me try again. Oh, I lost it. I can't get my Margo, we, we did um, see it originally. And so maybe if you can get back to that point. Um, okay. Okay, it'll be just a second here. Let me try it again. It's not showing it big though. There it is. 
Okay. So the cultural fire manage, can, you can see it now, right? The Cultural Fire Management Council is a nonprofit organization located on the Upper Yurok Reservation. We are composed of Yurok tribal members mostly, but we do not restrict ourselves to just tribal members. We have others um, in our group as well. Our goal is to restore the ancestral territory of the Yurok people, which is about half a million acres using fire as our tool. In this picture, you can see my sister in fire, Elizabeth Azuz, who is on the board of directors for the Cultural Fire Management Council. And she is lighting a torch made out of wormwood to, um, to start the test fire on this prairie unit that we're burning. The Yurok Reservation is in very mountainous territory and it is very thick with brush. It stretches a mile on each side of the river for the upper Yurok Reservation for about 32 miles. And so this is the task that we've set ourselves. Traditionally, we relied on the environment around us to provide for all of our needs, our food, our medicine, our basket materials, our, our clothing, our homes, and everything that we needed was provided by the land. When The land is healthy and productive. We lack for nothing. So the way that we take care of the land traditionally and even today is with fire. We don't burn the whole place at once. Different patches are burnt at different times depending on the time of year and, and what needs to be burned. The um, the men, when they go out hunting, if it is they, when they look around in the environment and see cues that tell them it's time to burn, then as they walk down off the hill, they will light it on fire. Perhaps they know uh, that a storm is coming and so they know that the fire will only burn for so long and then, and then the storm will put it out. Also in, in the time when when fire was a natural and regular part of the ecosystem, it would not get all wild and out of control like it does now. The reason why we're having all these wildfires now is because of the, the brush and debris that's built up on the forest floor. Back in the day when there was a regular fire regime by the First Nations people, the fire would just go, it would meet the creeks, it would go out or a fire would come or a, excuse me, a storm would came, come in and it would go out. So you see here in the top of our screen, some of our food sources. Uh, one picture that you don't see here, although there are hazelnuts here is acorns. And acorns are, are a primary food source for many tribes and they require fire in order to be healthy. If you don't burn underneath the tan oak trees, then the acorns become infested with little worms and most of the acorns will be no good. So if you burn under those trees every eight to 10 years, then it will get rid of those bugs and you'll have nice healthy food source. If you burn at night, the moths that live up in the canopy will see the flames and fly down into the flames. So you are ridding the acorns, not only of the bugs that are in them, but the moths up above that create those bugs. Underneath the uh, tan oaks, it's typical for huckleberry bushes to grow. And if huckleberries don't receive light, then they don't get big and juicy and they stop producing berries. 
So it's a fire is also important to keep the canopy open so that sunlight can reach the forest floor and 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 uh, make the the understory berries healthy and juicy and luscious. Acorns provide food not only for humans, but for many different kinds of animals. Deer is one of them. You'll see the deer in the center. Deer also like prairies. For many, many years, we did not see any deer on our reservation. Our young men would have to risk going off the reservation to get meat to provide food for um, their families. Since we have started burning, the deer have come back onto the reservation into all the places that we burned. And so traditionally and, and contemporarily, we burn to uh, keep the prairies open so that deer and elk have a hospitable place to live. We don't have elk on our reservation anymore. At one time, there were herds of elk and our land was about almost 50% prairie, but now it's only 3% of what it was and elk no longer live there. So one of the goals that we've set for ourselves is to expand those prairies in size so that the elk will come home. You'll see on the left-hand side, a, a young man pulling a fish out of his gill net and into his boat. And you might think, well, what does that have to do with fire? He's in water. But fire and water actually have a very close connection. Fire on the, on the landscape increases the quality and quantity of water. So when we look at our hillsides today and we see it all just thick with brush, all that brush is soaking up water. It's sucking up the water that would normally be contributing to the creeks, which would be contributing to the, to the river. And so those wet, damp places, they're starting to dry up. And the creeks, a lot of them, they don't run all summer anymore. But when we burn the hillsides and all that brush is gone, there's more water available to reach the creeks, which then reach the river, which cools off the temperature of the river. Fish need a certain temperature to, to live and be healthy. And if there's not enough water in the river, they may not survive. Another thing that um, fire affects in terms of water is the um, quality of water. When you stop to think about what is in the um, water filters that you buy, it's charcoal. And we are leaving charcoal on the land at a landscape level and it's acting as a giant water filter. On the bottom of this picture, you will see basketry and our basketry materials, some of them are fire dependent. They, our baskets are made with hazel and hazel is a serotonous plant. It must have fire in order to reproduce these straight sticks that you see on the left-hand side. We use baskets to carry our babies, to lift up prayer, for cooking, for eating, for just lots and lots and lots of stuff. This picture is up an area that has not been burned yet. You will see on the left-hand side some um, hazel, and you see how it has all those limbs on it. We can't use that for baskets. When it grows like this, it will have nuts if somebody or something picks them and eats them. However, if something doesn't pick them, then the, then the hazel will stop producing. And what happens is that this hazel will be so encroached on by other brush that larger animals can't get to it to eat the nuts off of it. And so it would stop producing. You'll see the thickness of, of the brush here. This is actually not near as thick as some places. Sometimes when we burn, the firelighters have to literally crawl through brush. 
You'll see on the left hand side and uh, a young fir tree and a fir, this fir tree is starting to encroach on what is supposed to be an oak woodland savanna. This is a post burn picture and you can see the difference. This is about a month and a half, two months after we have burned and all of the brush is gone. There's new growth coming up. You can see the remains of, of the smaller branches that didn't totally burn. Some of that char charcoal has leached into the soil, making the soil much more fertile. And you can see that this is a place that animals could move around. These are the places that deer will come back to. They'll roll in the ashes before the ashes are, are hardly even cool. And then they come back in the spring to eat the nutritious new growth and to raise their babies. The Cultural Fire Management Council is part of the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. And the goal of the network is to is to, um, to develop a plan, which we've already done, and to implement that plan to bring back true traditional burn practices. Right now we burn with um, fire engines and hose lays and, and people um, dressed in yellows and greens, uh, Nomex, most of the time. But there is a part of the year when we don't have to do that. That CAL FIRE doesn't require us to have a burn plan and they don't require us to have special qualifications. Between the months of late October through early April, the average person can burn their land. And so these are pictures of my family on Super Bowl Sunday and we are teaching our kids how to burn. One of the important lessons in learning how to burn and keep a, a fire under control is to start at the top. So you see on, on the left-hand side there, I'm teaching my grandson, we're leaning over and putting fire down, down the hill below us with some wormwood torches. And so we teach the kids about the importance of, of starting your fire at the top, paying attention to weather, which way is the wind blowing or is it blowing? And um, then once you get the top all black and then the sides, then you can see here on the right hand side, the kids are starting to light it from the bottom. And this will just burn up to where it already is black on the top and it won't go any further because fire needs fuel in order to burn. And then you see is the baby in, in his mama's backpack, look at him just looking at that fire. We had a conversation about how old kids should be um, when you first teach them about fire and a, and a guy from our neighboring tribe said, well, they need to be around fire from the time they're babies. And I'm like, wow, all right. <laughs> And then down below is, is my three-year-old grandson with his auntie, and she's teaching him how to safely, safely apply fire as well. Another strategy that we have um, just recently um, instituted is cooperative burns. And this has been an amazing um, um, an amazing way to start burning for us because this enables us to burn every time a burn window opens, meaning that you have a certain number of days of good weather, it's not too hot, um, it's not too wet. And so we, the cultural members of the Cultural Fire Management Council and the Yurok Tribe Wildland Fire did this cooperative burn together. You can see we have uh, on the right hand side is the cultural fire. We just have a truck with a little slip on engine that holds 300 gallons of, of water with a, 
with a pump that press, uh, pumps water high, high, high powered. And then the tribe has this fancy truck with the lights on it. And then they had a, another big fire engine. And plus we had a full the tank that holds, I forgot how much, how much water, a lot of water though. So you'll notice in, you will notice that this fire is burning from the road up and that's because the top has already been burned. This burn took place in the beginning of January when a burn, a burn window opened and it was home protection for an elder's home. And this is the gentleman that lives, lives there. He was in his shop when we first started setting up, putting the hose lays around and, and situating the engines and the people around the fire line. And then he came out to help burn the last part of it. And his wife is still in the house. You can see that this fire is uh, came, we started it at the top, it came down pretty dang close to the back side of their house. But you see there in the background, two people with uh, dressed in the Nomax and they both have water. One has access to water cooked up to a fire engine and the other has access to water from the big fold of tank that's holding water. And you can see how pleased this elder is to get rid of all that brush that was um, right going right behind his house. And this is a picture of the uh, of after the burn. You can see that most of the brush is gone. It came. We burned down to within about five feet of his house. He's his house is a, a newer style, and it has the siding that is fire resistant as well as the roof. Um, so that makes it nice. And he was really, as I said, really glad that he had this extra barrier of of protection around his home. After we burned behind his house, we went around to the front and we started the, the fire at the top of this little hill. And you can see it just slowly back in its way down the hill. And um, so we was really happy. We had about, I think we had about 13 um, uh, qualified firefighters on, on this um, cooperative burn. And, everything went really well. Another strategy that we use is called the training exchange or TREX. And this is for uh, only qualified uh, firefighters can participate in TREX. You have to have at least an entry level um, qualification and it goes all the way up to burn boss. A lot of people that um, do prescribed burns are primarily doing them as a fire prevention and to get rid of the brush. But when we have training exchanges on our lands, we choose places that are rich in natural resources. They either have a lot of basket materials or we're trying to enlarge the prairies. Maybe it's food sources or medicinal plants. And people from all across the United States and, and other um, countries come to help us burn our land. And while they're there, we will teach them about the cultural significance of the work that they're doing. Our culture is fire dependent. And so when they come, we will walk around the burn unit and show them which plants are medicine, which plants we use for herbal tea, which plants are hazel and will be turned into baskets to carry our babies or to cook the acorns at the world renewal ceremony. And these, you can see all of the different colored hats, people coming from different organizations. And it really changes their perspective about fire when they come to the cultural, uh, cultural burn training exchange because it gains more meaning to what they're doing. We do broadcast burns and uh, which generally means that you put a line around a fire line around the area that you're going to burn. And by fire line, that means to cut all the brush for 10 feet wide and then you scrape it down to mineral soil for two feet wide. 
and then you burn inside that area top starting at the top of this of the slope and burning your way down the hill and um, so that's a broadcast burn and it has um, it, it's a really a good benefit for the land and the water. So this is the kind of burns that we prefer to do. Occasionally, however, when we have a trex, we will get rain and we're not able to do a broadcast burn, in which case pile burns come in handy. And um, of course, it's pretty self-explanatory. If somebody has cut the brush and stacked it in a pile and then covered it up with something so it'll stay dry, and then you um, light it on fire and you can burn those any time of year. We don't really um, prefer pile burning because it burns really hot in one place for a long time and can kill the soil. Uh, where the pile was, it will regenerate after uh, a few years. Um, but you know, it is a good way to do a uh, fuel reduction and, and get some burning done. This quote is from the uh, one of the co founders of the Cultural Fire Management Council, Awok Tom Wilson. And he was the one that had the vision of of taking care of all, our whole territory. Fire is about new life, it purifies. And when the spring comes around, grass, birds, everything is real, enjoyable, new and fresh. The deer, elk and all wildlife come to the burned areas. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation for this evening. Um, I. I strongly believe that fire is not just something for native people. Fire is, is meant to be for all people, that it should be people's right to use fire to take care of their lands and protect their homes. And that we all need to work together to bring fire back to its rightful place on the landscape. The landscape is meant to have fire, it evolved with fire, and it's our responsibility as human beings to help make the land healthy again, as well as the plants and animals and the people. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Valentin Lopez, and I'm the chairman of the Amamutsun Tribal Band. Our tribe is comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples taken to missions San Juan Batista and Santa Cruz along the central coast of California. It's a pleasure and, a, and an honor to speak at the Berkeley Center for New Media, and it's an absolute honor to be speaking with a uh, with the, um, with the panel and with um, um, Margot Robbins, who I've known, uh, who've gotten to know very fairly recently, but I'm just um, amazed by, by her knowledge and wisdom and leadership. This evening, I'm gonna talk about the indigenous people's relationship to fire. And um, our creation story tells us our creation story tells us that Creator very, um, inten very intentionally gave us the responsibility to take care of Mother Earth. And we recognize that fire is a gift given, that fire is sacred. Next slide, please. That fire is sacred. And fire is a, um, also, um, a gift given to us from Creator. Um, the way our, our, what you see here is a book that tells a bit about our, a little bit about our creation story. And it uh, says that um, there was the badger people who lived on the ground who were the keepers of the fire. But then Eagle, um, the erected hummingbird, to go to the other ground I'm into the badger's home and to get fire and to bring it back so our people could have fire. 
Hummingbird had several other successful attempts, but then he was very determined. And so Hummingbird went underneath un into the badger world, got fire and brought it up in its beak. But the beak slid down to its throat. And that's why today the Hummingbird has a red throat. The Hummingbird did bring fire to our people. Fire is important because it, next slide. Fire is important because it provides warmth for us. Um, here you see our, our stewards uh, starting fire in the traditional way of using a, a, a drill and um, a, a platform that we call, that, that's made from um, buckeye. So you need a softwood for the, uh, a softwood for the spindle and a hardwood um, for the platform. Next please. Fire is also important for us cooking our foods. And here you see us proce uh, processing grass seeds um, into, a, into a, a food that, that we recognize as panole. And it's kind of like a mush uh, um, is, is what it is. And you could also make it into seed cakes um, and, and season it with uh, berries or um, other kinds of plants to give it to, 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 to help uh, enhance the flavors. Next, um, oh, uh, one thing about that slide prior, you, know, you saw that basket there. Um, our people actually cooked in the baskets. Um, they, they put water in and then they put hot rocks in the basket and stir them and stir them. And soon that water would be bu uh, bubbling and we would cook our foods in that hot water. The baskets were airtight and that's a incredible technology of our uh, that our people um, learn how to produce. Next slide, please. Fire also gives us, provides light in the dark. Here you see we're having a talking circle at nighttime. And here we have folks from state parks, the students and faculty from UC Berkeley. And um, we're talking about our tribal history and sharing stories of our tribe um, with them. And this is all part of an archeological field school that we did off the coast of Santa Cruz. Next slide, please. A fire is important for ceremonies and for dance. Uh, when we pray, um, when we hold ceremony, fire is always extremely important. Um, the smoke from that fire will carry, um, ca you know, we, we pray into the smoke and we pray, like when we have, we'll smudge ourselves to purify cleanse ourselves. And then we pray into the smoke from the, from the um, sage and the, the, the smoke from that fire will carry our prayers up to creator. But it carries not only our words, it carries the messages and the pain and the need for healing and the wants and the, and that are in our hearts and in our bodies and in our minds and in our spirits. So the way we pray isn't just with our words, we pray um, with, with our whole body. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what I'm gonna talk about this evening though is that fire is a tool um, for managing landscapes. It's a very important tool. And um, people don't recognize, a lot of people don't recognize, next slide. A lot of people don't recognize the fire, you know, the benefits of fire on landscape. To non-indigenous people, their relationship is with fire is that fire is to be something that to be afraid of, to see as very destructive. They read the headlines of the newspapers and they see that hundreds of thousands of acres are, 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 um, um, were destroyed, that houses were destroyed and stuff like that. But those fires, all of those fires would have never happened or none of those fires would have ever happened um, if our people um, when our people were stewarding these lands, it just, it just would not have happened. When our people stewarded the lands, they stewarded the lands so that it would provide um, lush, um, um, our, so that they, they would properly provide our food plants, our medicine plants, our basketry plants. And as you know, and this is repeating what Margo said, but our, 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 our housing, our clothing, our materials for um, nets and traps, etc. When we look at the hills and we look at the cultural resources, what we see there is our grocery store, 
our hardware store, our drug store, et cetera. They're all right there. And it, had, it was our responsibility to take care of them. So what you see here is a area that in which um, it would have looked like when our ancestors were here. The way our ancestors uh, took care of the lands is they took care of it in patches. And a lot of, many times, <clears throat> The plants would be taking that those patches would be different resources. They could be um, they could be a leafy a leafy plant. They could be a seed plant. It could be a, an Indian potato. It could be an Indian onion, Indian carrot. In California, there are eight kinds of Indian potatoes, but no one's ever heard about them or tasted them. Um, and that's a sad story because when the during those three periods of colonization of our people. They knew that we were very closely tied to our lands. And so to try to get us to that forced conversion, uh, they, they looked to destroy our environments and stuff like that, thinking that that right there would force us to convert to Catholicism or force us to, con to accept, um, to become citizens of Spain, et cetera. They also saw our food plants and our medicine plants um, et cetera, as being inferior to what they had in, in Europe. And so they th actually thought they were doing us a favor by introducing their foods to us. Next slide, please. As I said, here you see that, um, that field where we have pat you know, we're, we're patches and, and materials and stuff and the plants. Um, uh, the next slide I have kind of out of order a little bit, and that's saying that fire um, is not to be feared. Uh, we had a, a home that we stayed at. It was uh, state parks. Um, <clears throat> it was a home that, on state parks land that they allowed us to stay there as long as we were working on state parks land. And uh, on the day that that Santa Cruz fire, the SC, uh, SCZ fire came, uh, came in, uh, this is what we saw. And it was just a matter of a, a very short period after this, and we had to evacuate. But shortly after this, the fire came through and burned all the structures um, where we were living, and um, and and, and um, it, it, you know er, er, everything was lost. Uh, the house where we stayed at it was an old historic home, and so they took extraordinary measures to try and save that. Um, the house did burn partially, but not completely. And so now they're repairing that house and we will be moving back there um, fairly soon. Um, uh, the next slide, um, what I'd like to talk about here is the central coast of California. And, um, and that's from north of, of Monterey and perhaps even further south than that, up nearly all the way to San Francisco that entire landscape was a coastal prairie to the mountains. You see the mountains in the distance there. So all of this right here was a coastal prairie. And this was recognized as one of the most biodiverse landscapes in North America. And it was our ancestors who managed it, who managed it as a coastal prairie when they would look at a at a, at, a, at, a, at a landscape like this, they would divide it into segments, you know, and once, you know, uh, uh, and, and they would burn one segment a year. And it would not just be one big fire, as Margot said, that, you know, they'd have multiple burns. It would not be one big fire, but they would burn one segment per year. And, um, and so that first year of fire, um, it was important because um, you get a huge seed production. A lot of seeds uh, require the heat and the smoke to help them germinate. And it softens the seed so that it's easier for them to germinate. So you get a really lush and abundant crop of seed plants that year. And that seed plant is very important to take care of the birds and the other seed eating animals. Um, I, I said when I started that, you know, our, you know, we have the responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. We had the responsibility to take care of the birds, the insects, the fungi. We had responsibility to take care of the four-legged, the fish, the birds, etc. That was our responsibility. 
And so we, the way we manage these landscapes was in a very important way of ensuring that biodiversity, ensuring an abundance of those, of, of all those, the, the insects and the four-legged, et cetera. Uh, the second year of, um, after a fire, you start getting these taller shoots coming up. And those shoots were the preferred foods for the grazing animals, the elk, the deer, the antelope. That was their preferred foods. The third year, you start getting bushier plants. And those bushier plants were important for, for basketry, traps, cordage, et cetera. And it wasn't only that second year, there was other years as well, but that third year was kind of like the optimum um, for, for, these, for these materials. And um, um, you know, the plants, were, they were still young and very pliable and easy to work with. And so it was easy to make the, um, to make cordage, for example, for, for ropes, for strings, and for um, um, weaving materials, basketry, et cetera. Those, bu those bushier plants, though, they also were important for animals such as the, the squirrels and the rabbits and, and the mice, et cetera, because they were able to stay underneath the brush and have more shelter and be safer from the predators, the predator birds ahead above them and other predator animals um, who they can scamper away from. So that brush was very important to, to, those, um, to those creatures as well. Um, during the mission period in, um, in, and, and in 1778, um, the Spanish, um, government outlawed indigenous burning. And so our people have not been able to allow, you know, to practice our fire traditions um, since that time in 1778. Um, you know, that, that's well over, that's nearly 240 years and, uh, or over 240 years that our people had not been able to practice our indigenous burning. Uh, the, the mission period had ended in 1833, and uh, then, that then that was taken by, over by the, uh, the Mexican period. And uh, the Mexicans outlawed indigenous burning. And then in 1848, uh, the California and American period started. And, and during that period, of course, burning was outlawed. And so now we have these horrendous buildups of fuels and stuff like that, uh, 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 that, that are just so threatening and, and dangerous and such. And so um, next slide, please. And um, in 2006, we, our, our tribal elders came to an elders meeting and uh, a tribal council meeting rather. And they told us, they told us that our creation story tells us that we have the responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and, and all living things. And Creator never rescinded that obligation. That remains our obligation today. And we have to find a way to get back to it. And so, you know, there was a number of events that led up to it. But in 2012, and those were fortuitous events, what we did, you know, one, one thing that we did is we prayed and we asked Creator and we asked our ancestors to help us find a way to get back to the path of our ancestors so we can honor our ancestors and fulfill our, fulfill our obligation to Creator. And that led to, you know, and, and the events uh, from 2006 to 2012 allowed us to develop the Amamutsan Land Trust. And the four goals of our Amamutsan Land Trust are number one, to preserve and protect. Um, our, 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 our cultural and sacred sites. The second goal is to conduct um, research um, to allow us to, to restore the indigenous knowledge that had been lost because during those three periods of colonization, they wanted to destroy our indigenous knowledge, our culture and our spirituality. And uh, they were pretty darn close to succeeding completely, but now we're in the process of restoring our knowledge. And that's why I love sitting here today with Margo, you know, so, so that we can, so, that, you know, to get the information that she has so we can carry it home to our people. 
and we can learn that way. So thank you very much, Margo, for your, your talk. Well, the third thing is education, Edu you know, teaching our members uh, about our traditional ways and our obligations um, and teaching um, the public as well. And then the fourth one is a stewardship core. And that's what you see here. You see our stewards actively working on the lands. Our stewards are actually paid through our land trust. We, we, um, we, you know, we ask for donations and write grants. And, um, you know, and, 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 and from, from what we've gathered, we're able to pay our stewards to go out there and work. And uh, we're working hard to restore our use of fire. And um, because they, we have a burn on these lands here for, um, you know, for that long period of time, uh, there, there's a tremendous buildup of those fuel loads and stuff. And so we are having to um, cut down and clear out areas um, and then make the burn piles. And um, following this right here, we're going to start bringing in the regular burning regime that our ancestors did so that we can restore indigenous burning um, to these lands. Um, and it's important that we restore our lands to return the biodiversity of foods, medicines, and basket trees, but to also restore the biodiversity of wildlife, of, of the insects, of those that hop, those that crawl, of the four-legged, of the birds, and to clear the waters, as, as Margot said, about you know, the, 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 the healthy effect that um, that fire has in cleansing and cleaning the waters, et cetera. And then also to start taking care of the landscape so that they once again provide for the animals. In our territory, when you drive along the highways and you look at the and you look at the landscapes of the lands and stuff like that, um, Highway 101, Highway 5, Highway 99, you pick it. And um, you know the, what you're seeing there is 96% invasives. Our native plants are pretty much gone. So our land trust is also looking to restore our native plants. And our native plants are gonna be very important for climate change because our native plants, because those root systems of a lot of these grasslands, those root systems will go down 15 to 20 feet deep. That makes them very resistant to fire, to flood and to drought. And they're gonna be important for us to deal with the impacts of climate change. And we took care of plants so that they provided for a community and that community was a fungi. Um, was, was the fungi and the insects and um, the birds and the four legged, you, you know, each plant had a responsibility to all of those, to that full community. And so that's, that's the way our people are working hard today to restore our, um, our indigenous knowledge and restore our, our traditional stewardships of the land. And that, uh, is, and that right there is a good overview of our relationship with fire. Thank you. Wow, great. That was so amazing. Thank you so much, Chairman Lopez and Margo for presenting. Um, and now we'd you know, like to see some folks put things in the Q&A if possible, we do have time for that. Um, but first, uh, I would love to ask both of you uh, a question related to uh, diversity in this field of conservation and fire management. Um, so for you know, the past century, there's been a lack of diversity, uh, cultural diversity and gender diversity within California's conservation. Um, and seeing these photos shared by both of you, I did notice that there were still um, a lot of women as you know fire managers, and um, and I was wondering if uh, both of you could speak to the importance of uh, gender diversity within land management and fire, um, and maybe Margo, you could go followed by Chairman Lopez. Thank you. So in the fire world, there are many more men working um, in fire than women more and more women are starting to um, join this effort. And in our organization, we have, um, we have five, no, we have seven board members and two of our board members for cultural fire are uh, women. 
and by of our men. In our workforce, we have again, seven people and two are women and five are men. Um, but I am the executive director and I oversee all those men. <laughs> um, I, I never really um, paid a lot of attention, I'll, I'll have to say ab about diversity I um, in terms of, of um, different genders or along that line. Um, I was just kind of always like a tomboy and hung out with the boys and <laughs> so um, yeah there is there is a unbalance and we are um, we make sure that when we are accepting people to come help us burn for treks because we always get more than than we can accept that there is a good number of women as well. Um, uh, with the Arma Mutsin, well, traditionally, leadership of our tribe has always been women. It's unusual that I'm the chairperson for this, um, you know, with our tribe now. Normally, you know, um, it's women who lead our tribes and in all parts of our tribe. So um, our in our stewardship core, we, we have women out there. Um, when we have... Um, when we have open calls for stewards, you know, we're not getting 50 applications. A lot of times we get four or five applications. And um, there's always women among the mix. And um, we try to offer positions to all of them. Because if they want to learn, we have a responsibility to help them learn. And so what we'll do there is instead of working, you know, 30 hours a year, you know, we'll work more hours, you know, We'll work less, you know, less weeks while we try to increase our fundraising to be able to work additional weeks and stuff like that. But, you know, so, so the, 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 this, the, um, the, 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 the members who are interested in joining our land trust, um, uh, you know, provided that they're, are, you know, are, 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 um, have a strong interest and a desire, and they follow our rules. Because when we started our stewardship core, we asked our tribal elders what they what the expectations were for our our stewards, and they made a long list with a lot of <laughs> a lot of requirements in there. And they're all things that you know, just ways that our members, you know, should should be living their lives. And so, provided they can follow, you know, the the, the you know the you know those those um um request from our elders, uh, they're welcome to work. Well, thank you both for those responses. Uh, our next question is from an email we got uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, when we consider the long history of the use of fire by people on the land now called California, how do you describe humans role in the ecosystems? Why and how might humans be considered a keystone species? Uh, Margo, if you would like to start, please. So we are not separate from nature. We are meant to be part of it. That we have a place just like the animals and the plants and the wind and the rain. We have a place in the ecosystem. And it is not the sole responsibility of creator to set fires on the land with lightning. The pre-human race of spirit beings that made this world the way that we know it and inhabited this place before we came here, they gave us fire as a gift to balance not only the physical, but the spiritual well-being of the world around us. And it is our responsibility to do that in a good way, to do that the way we were taught in the beginning times according to the first agreement that we had with those spirit beings who agreed to come and stay and take physical form to provide for us and that we would also provide for them. Thank you, Margo. Um, 
it's hard to have anything to add to that. We are part of the universe. We're a critical part of the universe, but we're all equal um, in our, you know, the way that we see things is there's no, there's no hierarchy whatsoever. And um, even when we have meetings, we sit in a circle and in a circle, there's no, there, there's no start, there's no end. Uh, there's no leader, there, 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 you know, every one of that circle is equal. And that's the way we see it in, in the world. And, you know, we are, we are all equal. We're not um, any, don't, don't have any higher cause or, or, or purpose than, than the deer or the elk or the bear. Um, and, 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 you know, so we are part of that. We are part of the, the, the ecosystem. We are part of the environment and we're all equal partners. Um, I don't have a lot more to add than that. Um, Margo, you said, um, you said it pretty powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I would actually just like to add one um, small little piece and, and that is that our landscapes were the way that they were when non-native people arrived because of human intervention that he, native people did perp they purposefully made it that way and to keep things in balance it's just like if you have a big yard and you don't do anything to it what's that yard going to look like in five years in six years in 10 years well our yard is the forest and we took care of it just the way people take care of their fenced in yards. Thank you for those great responses. And yeah, we have plenty of questions to ask. So um, no worries if we can't get to all of them. But our next question, uh, there's two questions related to uh, the state of California working with indigenous peoples to help with land management policies. And I was wondering if either of you could speak to that. I, I can go first if you'd like. Um, you know, we, we are a federally unrecognized tribe. That, this is a very big difference um, between our tribe and Margo. She said that she kept contact with her lands. We were, we've been removed from our lands and we've been removed for a very long time. And so we're having to restore and reconnect uh, our relationships and understanding of our land now. And um, so we're in a much different place. Um, we hope to get to where um, Margo's tribe is and others. And we will someday, and someday you know, when, when, when we burn that right and creator allows us. But, um, but because of that, we um, were very, you know, also we are a very poor tribe. So we don't own, we do not own one inch of land. But then Creator didn't give us, you know, Creator did not give us the land to own. He did not give us any land ownership. He gave us the obligation to steward it and to take care of it. And so that's what our land, the purpose of our land trust is now, to steward and take care of the lands. And the way that we've been doing that is we've been working well, with government and non-government organizations that own the land. And that right there is national parks, state parks. Um, the Bureau of Land Management, county parks and city parks as well, and also um, open space districts and um, land trusts. We have MOUs and we work with them on their lands. Today we have access to over 140,000 acres within um, traditional territory. And so that we can, and, we, and those MOUs, you know, what we do is we, it's just that we have the right to ceremony, the right to, um, to gather, to gather uh, the resources, and also the right to gather there as a tribe, the right to um, have the education and, and the research there, and the right to you know, have a say in how those lands are taken care of and, um, and, and restored, et cetera. So we're, you know, we're, 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 we're starting to speak up and say, this is what we want. And, and uh, the people that own the land today, um, in all honesty, they don't know how to take care of the lands. They don't know how to steward the lands and they're recognizing it. If they knew how to take care of the lands, we wouldn't have these catastrophic fires, for example, you know? 
and, 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 and et cetera. So now they're starting to know that they, that indigenous knowledge is important and it's important that they listen to it. And so today uh, they are anxious to work with us so that they can learn. And um, that, that, that is the change that came, across, uh, that came um, into being just a very short while ago. And now with climate change, um, you know, our, our, the ways of our ancestors and stuff like that is gonna be very important for us to, to deal with or survive climate change. And that's becoming more and more apparent every day. And uh, indigenous people are, are capable and willing to and, and must take leadership in addressing climate change issues. And that's what we're doing as well. I totally agree. It is, I feel like the wildfires have been a catalyst for the, um, the different government agencies to seek out native people to, uh, to ask, um, ask for guidance and what they need, need to do because they recognize that what they've been doing for the past hundred plus years have gotten us into this situation where we're at. And so there is like the Senate Natural Resource Committee, the Assembly um, Committee on Climate, the, the state health organization, all these different places are contacting native people to ask for guidance and moving forward to, um, mostly they're worried about, about the wildfires and, and, and um, so they are definitely reaching out. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I think uh, our next question, uh, is kind of related uh, and it's about you know what can UC Berkeley or arts and design do now you know um, and I'm sure that both of you have, have had that asked a lot of you know what can folks do to help um, and yeah if either of you uh, would want to speak to that that would be great. Well asking for help you know asking how they can help is a, is a, is a question that's appreciated instead of telling us what we need to do so that's appreciated, you know. Um, um, I'm going to give a general answer to this, but it's it, it is it, it's what comes to mind, and I think it's what's critical, is that help the indigenous people develop a stronger voice for here, help them, you know, to like in our tribe, help us to restore our culture and our spirituality. All restoration of lands must start with returning the sacredness to the land. We have to recognize that Mother Earth is sacred, and it's important that we restore that sacredness to it. And because of that, um, you know, that's kind of like the last thing that, you know, the, the, the state parks or Bureau of Land Management, that they think about regarding their lands, that Mother Earth is sacred and needs to be maintained as sacred and such. So that, that, that you know, working with, you know, getting the tribe's voice recognized out there and then working with us and asking how they can help. A lot of times, you know, I mean, for example, um, this is sad. This is, really, this is something that brings me great sadness. But we've talked about the importance of indigenous burning for years and years and years. And we were always just seeing it as a myth or as, as something made up or something foolish, you know? But then the scientists started doing studies here and they find out that well, burning does soften up the seeds and, and, and it does help this, it does help with the germination. And so therefore, you know, burning does help. And so now that because science validates that, now it's true, but it wasn't true before. And so our indigenous voice, you know, we, you know our, our indigenous voice and our, our traditional indigenous knowledge and stuff like that has got to be valued and, 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 and respected. And, and that's, that, that's a very important way. I'll stop there. I think that there are a lot of things that, um, that would be helpful. Um, one is to, um, to give comments on bills that are going through, such as uh, Senate Bill 332, which will, um, which will change the liability um, for prescribed burns to a gross uh, 
gross negligence standard. Um, one of the huge prohibitive factors in um, doing more prescribed burns is liability. Everybody's afraid of liability. Another thing that would be, and there's, and there's other uh, bills being introduced as well. So if people would look those up and, and throw support, you know, email, call, send letters in support of those bills that are, are for prescribed burns, that's one thing. Another big thing is to change the public narrative about fire. We've had the message that fire is bad drilled into us for over a hundred years. That's like five generations of people that have been taught that fire has bad, is bad. And we need to change that narrative because there is such a good there is such a thing as good fire. And so the more people that start communicating that message to the general public, the better. Um, you know, you, enough people do it, we could make it trend. You know, I don't, I don't know all those ways that young people communicate, but I know that they're able to make things trend. <laughs> um, there's also, uh, um, students that are trying to get their PhD and they do the studies. We've had some, a couple come to our area and do studies like on the hazel or on the acorns and they get their PhD by, and, and they provide a service to us by, um, you know, collaborating and asking us, well, what do you need to have studied? And then they'll do their thesis on that. Um, I think it's really important to get the message out that fire belongs to the people. It should not be in the sole hands of government agencies, that the average person should have the right to use fire in a responsible way. So help share the good word. Thank you. Those were really interesting answers. Uh, and we have a, another couple questions that are a bit more technical about like how the current ecological conditions, uh, including you know invasive species and uh, effects of climate change, kind of shape the way cultural burns are practiced today in our in our current context. And I was wondering, maybe one of you could speak to that. You want me to talk on that one, Val? Yeah, why don't you take that one, Margo? Thank you for offering. Gosh, invasive species have been the bane of bane of our existence lately. We <laughs> those gosh darn scotch broom, they love fire. And so we are um, that'd be a good study for one of the grad students, how to get rid of the scotch broom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was an unintentional byproduct of the first burn we did. We burned in a hazel patch and there was a couple of um, a couple of scotch broom growing there and it spread up into our hazel gathering place. And we're like, oh no, how do we get rid of it? And so we talked with some different people who gave us some ideas. And um, so one of the things is that you're supposed to cut it all when it's in full bloom and then burn it. So that affects the time of year that you burn. And the same thing with those star thistles that grow on the prairie. If you just burn, they'll really like it. But if you'll burn them at a certain time of year during their growth cycle, it will get rid of them if you do it for a few years in a row. So normally we wouldn't go back and reburn the same place for at least three years. But on the prairie where those star thistles are coming in, where you're planning to start going in there uh, yearly at that certain time until they're gone. So it it um, affects when you burn as, as well as how hot you burn. Um, for the, uh, the scotch broom, we'll try to burn it really, really, really hot and try to you know get rid of all of it. But we haven't really uh, found a solution to that, but we're, we're working on it, so. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lopez, you're welcome to respond uh, regarding climate change and invasives if you would like. Well, um, as I said, our landscapes are 96% non, non, 
uh, non-native and stuff like that. So they've completely taken over. Um, they do not, I'm, I'm thinking uh, as far as protection, they don't develop the deep roots. And they, so they don't, they, don't, they don't take, you know, the, the invasives do not take care of the lands as well as the, 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 the native plants do. Uh, the other thing regarding fire is that our native plants, because they have the deep roots, uh, they'll stay green much longer at, at certain times of the season. You know, when you when at the end of the spring or going into the summer, you drive along, you look at the grassy hills and you see little patches of green there. Those are our native plants. They'll stay green much longer than the non-natives. And so there, there's less fire susceptibility to our native plants there as well. Um, so that's another uh, important thing for, for climate change related to fire. Um, and I also see with climate change, um, what's going to be, well, traditional stewardship is going to be important. Um, you know, I mean, our traditional stewardship, it develops, I mean, it ensures a, a, a healthy topsoil. The United Nations report recently um, said that there's only 60 years of topsoil um, left. And after that 60 years, um, there will be mass starvation. And it takes 100 years to create one year of topsoil. And so that's, that, 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 that's an issue facing us down the road. But when you look at it, the way our, our, our people uh, managed, uh, stewarded the lands and stuff like that, um, that will help you know, develop topsoil and, and help with food protections for the future. Um, those are just some of the, those are just what, that's what comes to mind, Alexi. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, our next question is uh, related to, you know, distinguishing a, a cultural burn versus a prescribed burn. Uh, and the question is, what does the preparation process for burns look like when working in an indigenous TEK framework? Modern science systems use models and systems uh, do you implement any of these methods, exclude them or reframe them to represent your traditional knowledge? Is this dependent on the type of burn, uh, cultural or prescribed? So maybe, yeah, if uh, one of you could just uh, provide a little bit of uh, perspective on that, that would be great. Margo, why don't you take this one because you've been doing this longer than we have. Okay, so, um... A prescribed burn is actually a prescription written down on a piece of paper by a qualified burn boss of the conditions that you're going to burn under. So how, um, how hot the temperature can be or how cool, how much moisture is going to be in the air, how hard the wind is going to be blowing. Um, the, and it describes the, like the, the way the slope is, um, the way that the slope is facing, how many people that you have to have on site to burn, how many um, engines, fire engines are going to be available, how much water is going to be on site, um, what the qualifications of the people are that are gonna conduct the burn. Those are all part of a prescribed burn. And in order to burn, you have to meet everything that's written into that burn plan and you check it off on a go, no go checklist. And if you can check off all of those different parameters, then you can go ahead and start a burn. And it has to be with qualified firefighters. A cultural burn can include a prescription, also known as a burn plan, but it doesn't have to. So for us, we do cultural burn training exchanges and we use a burn plan and we use qualified firefighters, but we're burning for cultural purposes. We also do cultural burns that don't have a prescription. We are we are at at our house and it's like, hey, this is a good day to burn. It's warm out. 
the, the stuff is dry, there's no wind, let's go out and burn. And maybe we are burning our hazel patch if it is spring or, or fall, or maybe we're burning the, those briars on the prairie to get rid of those briars. Or maybe we're burning our place that we gather acorns because there are, are starting to get too many bugs in our acorns. And so a cultural burn is, is um, it is land based and it is a connection between the indigenous people that come from there and the land, You're con it, it's a connection between people and place. And a prescribed burn may or may not have that connection. They might just be out burning brush because they don't want a wildfire. So that's my definition of the difference. I'd like to um, say something here real quick. And for us, uh, a prescribed burn is a, its primary goal is to reduce um, is to reduce uh, fuel loads. Whereas a cultural burn, it is to control, I mean, it is for the purpose of enhancing cultural resources. Yes. That's a very big, uh, that's a very big difference. Another thing you mentioned a couple of times about burning the, the acorn, and I talked about returning spirituality to the land. Well, that's very important because Burning the, the, when you burn a, a wooded forest and stuff like that, that smoke goes up into the into the trees. In the same way we smudge our sows before a ceremony, that smoke is actually um, purifying and um, and cleansing that tree spiritually. And so that you know, so so the, there's an important spiritual element to burning as well. Thank you, Val, for that. <laughs> Yes, thank you both. I've been writing notes for all of these responses. So uh, incredibly helpful. And I'm sure that our listeners are also, you know, taking down this information. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we can't get to any of the other uh, questions because we're at uh, time just about. But I'd love to give this space to um, allow you, Margo and Chairman Lopez, to provide any concluding or closing thoughts that you might have that maybe we didn't get to. Well, I'll, I'll go first and then we'd like to end on your words, Margo, because you're doing such a wonderful job. <laughs> it's important that people recognize that our ancestors were not hunters and gatherers. When you're a hunter and you're a gatherer, that just means you're, you're just randomly looking for food. And if you happen to find some, it was a lucky day for you. Um, our people were very intentional in the way that they managed and stewarded the resources of the lands. And, um, and they were very prayerful um, for, the, 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 for these lands and stuff like that. So I think that the thing, the message here is that, there's, you know, our people study these lands for 15, 20,000 years. And if you think of that in terms of generations, that's, you know, 1,200, 1,500 generations. I mean, and, and, and knowledge, was intentionally learned and passed on to generation to generation to generation. So how smart is it to ignore that knowledge and say, let's start over, or that knowledge is useless. That indigenous knowledge is critical for our path going forward in so many ways, in so many ways. And people just have to recognize it. And, um, and if we're gonna survive going to the future and if we're gonna you know, find ways to, to address the, 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 the thing with climate change, but also the things with relationships and, um, and spirituality, et cetera, and the indigenous voice must be heard and the indigenous voice must be, uh, must be the leader. Thank you. Perfectly said. I think all just wind us up with the song. This is a flower dance song. It's a coming of age song for a young girl. It has one word, it's pakwa'ila, which is uh, a maple tree. 
and during the preparation for that young girl's ceremony, they gather bark from the Pequot Elat to make her a skirt. And this song is to honor, honor that ma the maple. Eowa, hiowa, heyowa, pqua ela. Eowa, hiowa, heyowa, pqua ela. Eowa, pqua ela. Eowa. discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Margo and Herman Lopez for your thoughts, your songs. Um, and I know that I learned so much today, this evening, and I think, you know, all of our other participants uh, involved in this did as well. And so, uh, yeah, thank you again for the Berkeley Center for New Media and uh, Arts Plus Design for supporting this Indigenous Technologies event. Um, hopefully everyone has a good rest of your week. Uh, and is able to take on this, these knowledge and these thoughts uh, shared by these wonderful cultural leaders uh, with them in the coming weeks and the coming years. Uh, thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good night.